And uh, let's move to the third uh, keynote uh, for the third track of this conference. Uh, if you remember, we mentioned uh, digital natives, we mentioned uh, the information infrastructure. Now we are going to look at the spatial infrastructure. And uh, to do so, uh, we invite uh, Professor Antoine Picon from Harvard University and uh, Professor Jeff Huang from uh, the Ecole Polytechnique in Lausanne in Switzerland. Because, uh, and the, the latter is um, the track leader. Yes, please come. They will lead us to explore the space, uh, both physical and virtual, that uh, is going to be inhabited and to some extent is already inhabited by the digital natives uh, who use the information infrastructure that we explored before. Thank you. Thank you. The possibility for higher education to expand beyond the wall of classrooms, as well as the potential consequences of this expansion for design, is a relatively ancient subject of architectural speculation. In the 1930s, the American engineer and architect Buxmith Fuller had envisaged, for instance, the replacement of traditional universities by radio broadcasted higher learning programs. But despite these early speculation, relayed by the interest raised by institutions such as the Open University among some of the 1970s architectural avant-garde, it's only recently that the issue has attracted a broader range of reflection among architects, urban designers, and planners. In this short presentation, intended as an introduction to the question of the impact of the development of cyber learning on physical academic space, I would like to bri discuss briefly some of the implication that can be envisaged in the near future. And to be clear, I'll be probably more architectural than urban, knowing that the broader planning scale is also a major source of questions and um, interrogation. What still appeared to be a remote perspective a few years ago now seems very close, so close that designers have indeed to start to prepare actively for the changes it will bring. An illusion must be first discarded. The notion that cyberspace entails the collapse of physical space. It's worth noting, by the way, that this notion of a collapse of space caused by the development of telecommunication is one of the oldest myths of industrial modernity. The invention of the telegraph had already fostered ideas of this kind, just like te uh, and uh, later TV, etc. Just like time, space, physical space, that is, is definitely not abolished by the development of online activities. To the contrary, in a way, just think a minute on how every meter counts when one is trying to get some signal on a, an, a phone or a computer in a room. More generally, the presence of electronic terminals generates specific spatial attributes and practice. Now, academic space will be for sure profoundly altered by the development of electronic worlds. As I just mentioned, the quality of space already depends on its degree of connective properties. Places when the, where there is no wireless connection are definitely not the same as places where one gets an excellent signal. Let me remark in passing that we have today a tendency to reason according to the dichotomy between connection and no connection, with a definite privilege given to the former on the latter situation. But what if being non-connected at certain times was as precious as being able to browse the internet and read one's mail? There is a specific quality of the time spent in places when there is no temptation to escape in cyberspace. By the same token, one may imagine all kinds of gradation between the situation of full connectivity and the total deprivation of it. Such gradation could be similar, but also not reducible to the traditional spatial hierarchy leading from public to private space. 
And this could offer a new way to think of the distribution of space, of academic spaces in particular. And since the two gradients are not reducible one to the other, it could lead to all kinds of interesting combination, public spaces with no connection, and very private, semi-private or private spaces highly connected. One could again env envisage classes where students would not read their email while uh, listening to the professor, which could be sometimes an attractive perspective to some members of the academic community. So in other words, we need to structure what still appears as somewhat non-architectural. This is a representation from Carlo Ratti's Sensible Lab a few years ago of the wireless in MIT. Now, the development of a higher education cyber component presents even more profound consequences on academic space than the perspective of an enriched spatial hierarchy depending on the interaction between the public-private and the connected, non-connected scales. Cyberspace brings an end to the intimate link between space and action that still characterized a large part of academic life. Until recently, Lectures and seminars still followed the rule of unity between space and action that characterized French classic theatric, theatrical play. A lot of things will more and more often take place in the electronic realm, let the individual uh, active online be physically present or not. In a, some ways, to go on with this metaphor, from a French classical tragedy, one may very well move to something closer to a Baroque opera with the multiple threads provided by the theatrical plot, the music, and the various machines that move sets on stage and create special effects. Another way to describe this shift is to refer to the notion of an, um, uh, an augmented reality. Augmented reality is fundamentally hybrid, a hybridity that presents a number of very concrete consequences. In the classroom, I spoke of a kind of break with the unity between space and the action taking place. In the classroom, student will be more and more often both physically present and mentally far away, cruising on the digital seas. At other times, they will be also physically present in the class, as well as engaged together in common electronic activities that enrich the course of a seminar. Such situation represent both a challenge and an opportunity for the designer. Let me just mention at this stage a number of possible scenario and strategies, or rather, possible situation. Among the first thing, we may have to rethink what partition means, since people can be physically together and actually separated in terms of attention and activity, and conversely, uh, and conversely. Uh, the, the heterogeneity and hybridity of space uh, will be greatly increased. It was a question raised a few years ago by the practice, architectural practice, Diller and Scofidio in their Blur building, which was by definition a building without any partition. But then they had imagined initially to have brain codes in which people would enter a system of individual preferences and the, the, the codes would recog recognize people with similar set of preferences. So in a way, a non-partition space in which partition can occur following other means. One may sometimes also want to refocus the drifting attention of the students on what is going on in the physical space. A dramatization of the space can be the answer. This may entail playing on physical senses ranging from vision to hearing, touch, and why not smell. The sensory dimension has been often neglected in academic spaces. The development of cyberspace might represent an incentive to re-examine this issue. Related to this question, it is interesting to pay attention to the numerous links that relate digital experimentation in architecture today to the question of the senses from, from the tactile character of digitally produced architectural ornaments to the number of high-end fashion boutiques and restaurants based on innovative digital design and fabrication. Here, for example, a restaurant designed by the Boston-based architectural practice Office Da that is quite typical of this trend. The time has perhaps come to invest this renewed set of connection between architecture and the senses in the design of academic spaces. Conversely, physical space can also help making electronic life richer and more productive. 
One may even imagine scenarios in which physical space is designed as an extension of cyberspace. In other words, instead of interpreting the electronic world as an enrichment or augmentation of physical reality, it, it, it is physical reality that may become an augmentation of cyberspace. Uh, spatial dramatization represents there again a possibility and to mention to go back to dealer and coffee your practice I've always found quite interesting the computer room of the Boston Institute of Country Art in which you have very clearly a kind of convergence between a very dramatic physical setting and the fact that it's devoted to browsing online resources the interaction between the physical and the electronic realms may lead to new conception of space centered on terminals. Why not imagine that space itself is organized around them instead of being structured by physical openings such as doors and windows? This is quite clearly one of the paths leading to a more efficient design of augmented reality and here uh, the pioneering Swiss house of my colleague Jeff Wong will be addressing you in a few minutes. Shouldn't also the totality of space be thought as an interface? It's a proposition that has been made by various contrary digital design theories and practitioners taking space very literally as an interface. In augmented reality, it's worth noting that space possesses for sure a pedagogic character. Movements in space may correspond to movements in the mind to learning patterns, a theme that has been explored repeatedly by science fiction novels and movies, here Minority Report, but as you know, this is entering the gaming activity and tomorrow, education. Now, such a reconception of space entails simultaneously a more thorough interpretation of terminals in spatial terms. How are we to think of them? There again, the possibilities are extremely varied they can be thought as door or windows leading to other virtual or physically remote rooms. They can be interpreted as new kind of mirrors, increasing the sensation of physical space. They can be conceived as mere object in space like traditional TV sets or computer monitors. The range of possibilities is of course further increased by the perspectives opened by distributed and pervasive computing. Terminals will more, will more and more cohabit at all scale covering walls or smaller than the hands that holds them. And this is a question, by the way, for designers today, what will be the, term, the scale at which de to design things in uh, today's emerging digital culture. Now, the future of academic spaces is inseparable from the perspectives opened by the possibility to decentralize and distribute part of the teaching and learning activities. Some of the most radical changes brought to the physical organization of universities will be probably a consequence of this decentralization and distribution. This affects already, as we know, libraries. In many places, students read, you, uh, use more, more and more online resources, a practice that entails using libraries in a profoundly different way than before. I will return to these points in a moment. It is worth noting that uh, the phenomenon um, is not without analogies with this evolution that have taken place in the past. After all, the emergence of printing was itself synonymous with the potential for decentralization and distribution of teaching and learning. The book challenged the medieval pedagogic method based on the sole oral teaching of the professor in a densely packed classroom. Another useful historical reference, in, in my opinion, is the emergence of network structure during the 19th century that forced designers and planners to think in distributed terms instead of centralized one. This is the, the water in, uh, supply network of 19th century Paris. Networks also fostered an approach in terms of service. We might also want to see the development of cyber education as a reinforcement of the service component of academic activities. Buckminster Fuller, to mention him again, liked to stress the position between object and service thinking. He insisted on the fact that owning a phone had far less meaning than subscribing to a phone plan. Now, every iPhone owner knows that Buckminster Fuller was not entirely right if we are to take into account what has happened with the development of cell phones and the emblematic role played by smartphones. 
In a, certain, in a certain number of cases, object still matters. They are indispensable supports of e-life. They are symbols of social status. An additional clue is provided, maybe provided by looking again at 19th century urban networks. The development of these networks was contrary with the search for a new urban monumentality. This is very clear in the case of metropolises like Vienna or Paris, in which the 19th century monument is the monument in the middle of networks. What I'm basically trying to convey is that the decentralization and even dispersion of academic activities under the influence of cyberspace will be probably counterbalanced by the need for reinventing or reinterpreting central university spaces. Even before the development of cyberspace, university structures have followed this kind of pattern. If we take Harvard, for example, the development of the Cambridge and Boston campuses with their few hundreds different structure has found its counterpart in the periodic reaffirmation of the centrality of the yard and its main facilities, a reaffirmation extremely visible at times such as the commencement. In more concrete terms, we may have to rethink of the role of central facilities from libraries to auditorium. Part of the reflection entails purely functional aspects, such as what must be the role of these central facilities vis-a-vis -vis a number of remote places that will appear as branches. Beyond this functional aspect, I would like to propose here two other types of tracks that it may be useful to explore as well. The first has to do, once again, with the importance that physical experience will always retain at both an individual and social level. What can we do at the physical core of the university that we cannot do online or connected to the main campus from remote places? There again, the sensational and emotional dimension provide useful guidelines to rethink the role of these facilities, just like their potential for encounters. Speaking of encounters, it might be useful also to contrast the necessarily framed and designed nature of online interfaces with a more casual and often hazardous character of what happens in physical life. Why not conceive central facilities not only as a, in a more public space oriented perspective, but in reference to the terrain vague, that is uh, the, a somewhat indeterminate place where the unexpected may happen. For libraries, the unexpected was supposed to be limited to the serendipitous discovery of a new book in the stacks. We may now want to conceive them as places in which the unexpected, a somewhat program unexpected, of course, may take place. I spoke of a program unexpected. unexpected. This is a paradox very close to the one that philosopher Paul Ricoeur placed at the core of literature. A good plot is full of twists and turns, but these must be plausible, in other words, inscribed in a pre-existing matrix of possibilities. This is what the narrative genre achieves, to somehow program the unexpected. We may, might want to reinforce the narrative dimension of our university's new central spaces. Libraries used to tell stories mostly about books. They may have to enrich their repertoire of possible tales. Physical and social experience, as well as program randomness. This first direction of development goes with a second one, a strong symbolic character. Symbols bordering the logo used for branding are becoming more and more necessary in our electronically augmented global world. We need to readdress the question of the symbolic in the cyber age. Let me note again, uh, quickly that the symbolic role of physical space is not linked only to the iconic character of this and that building or monument, Widener Library building and John Harvard statue, to take again the, the example of Harvard University. They are also the bearers of broader symbolic values. Take, for example, the impact that the spatial figure of the quadrangle still has on faculty and students' minds centuries after the foundation of Oxford and Cambridge. I mentioned the logo. The risk is to fall into the trap of mere branding, forgetting that symbols are supposed to be connected to shared ideals and values. This is probably a major challenge awaiting the designers who will be in charge of orienting the physical development of central university physical spaces in the near future. By the way, it's quite striking how branded 
global architecture has become an obsession for all the university that can afford it. At this stage, and not as a conclusion proper, rather than as a way to open further the question, I would like to finish this presentation by evoking two problems, the repercussion of which are far from being clear on design at this stage, but which are still very present in a lot of discussion going on on digital architecture. The first is anthropological. It is impossible to think about uh, physical space without thinking about the subject that is supposed to inhabit it. And in some way, the digital revolution is probably nothing else than a new change in the conception of the subject. We may have in this respect to imagine that we no longer design for individuals the life of which mostly happens within the li limits of their bodies, and we're back to the dossier, the digital dossier of this morning. Cybernetician and anthropologist Gregory Bateson had already envisaged such a perspective as in, in his 1972 Steps to an Ecology of Mind. It entails to abandon the notion of a clear-cut distinction between human subject and their environment in favor of a model in which we inhabit multiple overlapping layers or spheres. Given that some of these layers or spheres are heavily loaded with technology, it means also that we may have to consider the new subject as somewhat cyborg-like. Even more radically, if we're out to follow the various thinkers of the so-called post-human condition that try to articulate this technological dimension with a philosophical input of Gilles Deleuze or Bruno Latour, it may mean that the subject must be thought as inherently multiple, network-like, a point of view endorsed by contrary neurosciences here in Neuronal Network. William Mitchell, the late Mi William Mitchell, had begun to explore what this could mean in practice for designers. In his 2003 book, Me++, The Cyborg Self and the Network City. Closer to the subject of this conference, as the designer of one of the most celebrated library projects of the past decades, the Sendai Mediatek in Japan, uh, J Japanese architect Toyo Ito declared, as for him, and I quote, we of the modern age are provided with two types of body, the real body which is linked with the real world by means of fluid running inside, and the virtual body linked with the world by the flows of electrons. To this characterization, one may be tempted to add that these bodies are more like networks than finite and compact substances. And the Sendai Mediatek tried to convey metaphorically what this meant with its strongly marked slabs pierced by what appeared like channels of energy, light, and electronic communication. With augmented reality, we will we'll live almost literally in a physical space with holes or bypasses. In the university of the future, uh, the reflection on physical space will be inseparable from the consideration of such subject, which are not only digital native, but are also profoundly different in, in terms of how they inhabit uh, both uh, physical and electronic space. A different subject, and I will be very brief about it, but this is probably one of the biggest questions we are confronted to, is the changing time frame. It may sound as a truism, but let me remind you that space and time usually go together, and designers are actually always confronted to the rhythm of life. How do we think of time? And there again, it's quite striking to see how contradictory is the present situation with uh, a, a lot of seemingly opposite direction taken. Real time on the one hand, differed time on the other, synchronicity, asynchronicity, long-term strategies, and shorter and shorter attention span. So the individual and social experience of time is changing rapidly. There is a crisis also of the perception and understanding of historical time, something that a lot of people have been uh, dealing with in the past years, like, for example, the American sociologist Philip Zimbardo and others. So such a crisis of historical times makes, by the way, the reinvention of an authentic symbolic function of physical space quite difficult. More generally, we might need to understand better how space and time will intersect in the cyber age 
uh, if we want to design satisfying physical spaces for university. It might look like a philosophical problem, but it's a very everyday problem. Space and the rhythm of time is an open question today. As I said, it's a very challenging moment, but I think it's also uh, full of opportunities for designers. Thank you.